the uh, record from we are back in session. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, all members of our jury and all Mr. President, our witnesses back on the witness stand. Did anyone uh, regret the examination? Um, just a couple things briefly. And Mr. Jackson's available to give us a 32 and dim the lights. <coughs> Sergeant Smith, this is Exhibit 940, do you recall that? Yes, sir. Do you know exactly which perspective this uh, photograph was taken from, top, bottom, side, right, left? Uh, no, I'm not 100%. I believe it's from the, the side, though. But I'm not 100% sure. Okay. But I want to take you back to Exhibit 403. Do you recall... Exhibit 403. You recall this, the uh, photo from the right rear passenger side of uh, the defendant's truck? Yes, sir. Okay. I want to zoom in on the tail light. What do you notice about the underside characteristics of that? And this is going to be another photograph of that tail light. What you see, and I'll, I'll point it out with the laser pointer, is this underneath portion is a, it's a clear plastic, um, and that's to illuminate the license plate. Last but not least, Your Honor, um, just because of the difficulty we're having with the lighting uh, and the overhead, I'd ask to publish the old-fashioned way exhibits 938, sorry, 35, 36, 38, and 39 to the jurors by hand. Okay. And with that, I have nothing further. 35, 36, 38, 39. <laughs> circulating those? Okay. I had nothing further. Anything on redirect? I mean recross? There you go. Okay. Thank you, Sergeant Smith. You may uh, step down again. Still subject to recall. And will we have some other evidence? Uh, at this time, I'd ask the court's permission to publish 951, and I believe Mr. Jackson has copies of 951A to distribute. Okay, so a couple of things about the, the next exhibit. Um, the next exhibit is a video interview of Mr. Merritt by CNN. And uh, that was subpoenaed by the prosecution CNN, like any other news organization, when they get a subpoena for information they have, their policy is 
to only provide that material that they actually aired. So if there's you know a two-hour interview and they air 30 seconds of it, they're only going to give the 30 seconds that they air. Um, so uh, this the, what as you can see from the transcript, this is a very short. Uh, interview. We don't know if there are uh, if this is the entire interview or if it was a much longer interview and this is only a portion of it. Okay, so you can consider that in uh, considering it. Uh, we also uh, only have the uh, affidavit that was submitted with the subpoena where CNN says they verify that this is an accurate recording of the material that they aired or that they posted on their YouTube site. Uh, so we don't have that person here to actually testify about the interview. So all we have is this portion uh, of the interview. So with that uh, explanation for ready to play that, you can go ahead and do that. So you said you cooperated a great deal with authorities. You were questioned by detectives. What did they ask you? The standard questions, you know, just do I know anything about disappearing? Um, did I have anything to do with it? Um, just, just the standard questions, and probably they asked everybody. As far as you know, you were the last person, or at least one of the last people to see him, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when he left Rancho Cucamonga, nobody else, uh, although I, th I think somebody, there's another person or two that he talked to, I'm not sure. Um, well, you were the last person he saw. I'm definitely the last person he saw. Okay. You are ready. Uh, we've uh, completed playing uh, 951 and following along on the film script. Um, pursuant to the discussions of the court, the people at this time will conditionally rest upon the admission of exhibits and the motion to reopen. Okay. Uh, so that means uh, the, uh, this basically concludes the uh, case of the prosecution. The, with one possible exception, we may have one additional witness that they might be calling. Uh, either reopening their case or in rebuttal. Uh, the defense, of course, uh, didn't know for sure that the prosecution weren't exactly they would be finishing. Um, most of the, uh, or many of the defense witnesses are from out of the area, so uh, they need to, some time to arrange to get them here and arrange a schedule. Also, uh, they have an idea of a number of witnesses that they may be presenting, but a final determination of that often depends on waiting until the prosecution finishes their case to say, well, maybe we already covered this with Cross, uh, maybe we thought we needed this, but we don't, or uh, so there's some decisions they need to make and some arrangements they need to make to get those witnesses here. So that's a long explanation to tell you that we're going to have a little bit of a break before we actually start their side of the case. Uh, I think the plan is that we would not come back until uh, next Tuesday, March the 12th. Is that right? If that was the final decision, that's correct. Correct. Okay. And we'll, we may start with the defense case at that point. The prosecution may have one uh, final witness at that point. And even if they do, uh, once that witness is done, then the defense would be ready to start uh, their case. Uh, so, a couple things. Number one, it is still really, really important for you not to form or express any opinions about the case. Uh, because for two months, You've only heard one side of the case. You've heard some 
issues raised in cross-examination, but you haven't heard any of the actual evidence that the defense may want to present. Uh, so it's still critically important that you keep an open mind and that you not form or express any opinions about the case. And of course, not discuss the case with anyone or allow anyone to discuss the case with you or in your presence. It's also critically important that you not read anything about the case, that you not follow any of the news media about the case. There may be some discussions that I'm having with the lawyers between now and next Tuesday about legal issues in the case, uh, evidentiary issues, uh, just a number of things that may or may not get reported in the papers uh, or the media. None of that concerns you. Your only uh, job is to consider the evidence that's ultimately presented to you. Uh, so if there's things reported in the paper, there were uh, motions or evidentiary hearings or whatever, uh, none of that concerns you. So don't follow any of that. Don't listen to any of that. Uh, and with that, uh, we will see everyone back uh, next Tuesday, March the 12th. Uh, I think we'll have a better idea to be able to give you a very tentative, stressing very tentative, uh, time schedule as to what it looks like uh, when we might be finishing uh, this phase of the trial, okay, uh, after next Tuesday. So we will see everyone back next Tuesday, March 12th, 9.30 in the morning. I'm sure your employers will be happy about that. <laughs> so. You want to take a vacation between now and next Tuesday? That's between you and your boss. <laughs> Left, uh, council and parties are still present. Did you uh, wish me to make the important one motion today, or would you uh, want some time to review that and do it tomorrow morning? I, I think today is fine. Okay, go ahead. Uh, at this time, uh, defense would make an 1118.1 motion. Um, I'll point the court to the new case from 1973 of People versus Wong that sets the standard. I'm sure the court is well aware of. Um, one case I did find of interest was People v. Pantino, which is 1979, 95, Cala, 3rd, 11. Um, in that, it helps define the substantial evidence that's required for each element. And in Pantino, which is P-A-T-I-N-O, uh, the evidence must be the type that it reasonably inspires confidence and is of solid value. I think all the elements of murder have been satisfied clearly. Uh, it comes down to identity. <laughs> of yes. course. Yes. Um, and as the court has heard the evidence in this case, uh, the people have presented a lot of information that goes to motive. They have presented a lot of uh, information saying, well, we don't know where he was at this exact time, so he had an opportunity. And the defense position would be as that's not of a solid value. They have zero direct evidence. Obviously, this is a circumstantial case. And the evidence that is presented, uh, many of the people's own experts and witnesses even said it's reasonable to say uh, that this was here for another innocuous reason or what they're seeing. Uh, there's no evidence of a murder that's occurring inside the home. There's no evidence of cleanup. Uh, there's nothing in the home that supports the theory that the people are presenting that the family was killed inside the home on the night of the 4th. Uh, if it happened on any other day, they can't put our client anywhere near the home. Uh, so the court's fully aware of all the facts of this case. And I know the standards on 1118.1, but uh, we do make that motion that the court grant an acquittal and dismiss the case. Or at least our client. Okay. People wish you were. <laughs> I guess I, I guess I'm in. Tag. Um, Your Honor, there people believe that there is more than sufficient evidence for the court to deny the motion 
and allow a jury to make a decision on whether or not the people have proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is the one responsible for the brutal murders of the McStave family. Not only is there strong circumstantial evidence of motive, there's strong circumstantial evidence of a means to carry out uh, that crime, as well as dispose of the evidence and bury the grave and bury the victims in the grave sites out in the desert, as well as substantial evidence uh, of his opportunity to do so, including the dumping of the body, the burying of the bodies in the desert, the dumping of the trooper at the uh, border, etc based on the cell phone evidence uh, and the other circumstantial evidence around that, including his DNA in the trooper, one of which in positions in which would have placed him as the driver, which he denies ever having driven that trooper. The um, interesting thing of note is in that interview, he indicated at one time he was a passenger about a month or two earlier when he had played a strenuous uh, game of paintball with uh, Mr. McStay uh, out at Camp Pendleton, yet his DNA is not found after a nice, strenuous, presumably sweaty game of uh, paintball anywhere on the passenger side of that vehicle. Uh, yet it's on the steering wheel and the control devices for the vehicle on the other side. The court is aware of uh, the Mitchley video that places a truck with similar unique characteristics to that of the defendants leaving at or about the time um, or shortly thereafter that the mixed days really drop off the face of the earth. Uh, the cell phone evidence, the tire depression evidence, and not to mention then looping back around to motive uh, and means. The overriding interest in this case is that every financial transaction of that was suspect in this case uh, that was done remotely whether it was done by the defendant or not, but clearly the implication it was, benefited the defendant. All of the suspicious checks were made out to the defendant, several of which, if not all but one or two of which, he cashed or deposited into his bank accounts. He was the one that benefited from uh, the theft from the victim prior to their disappearance and then after their disappearance. The way the circumstances lay out on February 4th, I believe it is clear that um, he had been caught with his hand in the cookie jar, and it's that that leads to the disappearance on the 4th, when from 5.30ish p.m. to 9.23 p.m., he is effectively off the cell phone grid, and no one can put his whereabouts uh, anywhere, not at his rancho home, not at a casino, um, but all of a sudden mysteriously popping up uh, in an north of the victim's residence in Mira Loma between the 60 and 91. Based on the totality of the circumstances, people believe that we've carried our burden, that there is sufficient evidence for this jury to reach a verdict one way or the other. And we'd ask the court to deny that motion. Okay. So, uh, as pointed out by both sides, uh, this is strictly a circumstantial evidence case. And so I did spend a fair amount of time going through uh, the testimony and the exhibits to thoroughly examine the evidence that was presented. Uh, and first, as pointed out uh, by the defense, the standard that the court uh, utilizes in ruling on the 1118.1 motion to dismiss is the same as that applicable to uh, an appellate court reviewing a conviction uh, for sufficiency of the evidence. Uh, and that standard is that the court is to consider all of the evidence and uh, all of the uh, inferences, uh, reasonable inferences to be drawn from that evidence uh, to determine if there is any substantial evidence of each element of the offense and obviously of identity uh, of the perpetrator. If there is uh, any substantial evidence to support a jury's finding of guilt, then the motion uh, to dismiss should be denied. Basically, as pointed out, there's a number of different uh, 
discussions of what substantial evidence is, uh, including what Mr. McGee quoted. Uh, other reports have said that it's basically uh, evidence that a reasonable trier of fact could find the defendant guilty from, and the court finds that if the jury did find the defendant guilty based on that evidence, there is substantial evidence to support that uh, finding by the jury. So the court has reviewed the evidence in some detail to determine uh, if the court can say if the jury returned a verdict of guilty, is there substantial evidence to support such a finding? So we start off really with the testimony of Susan Blake, the very first witness uh, in the trial. And it turns out, at least from my perspective, when combined with much of the other evidence, her testimony is critical evidence. Uh, she lays out the basic foundations that Joseph was in a business, Earth Inspired Products, to uh, create, manufacture fountains or waterfalls, and that uh, Mr. Uh, Merritt was uh, involved in that business with him, as was uh, Mr. Cavanaugh. So she lays out that foundation. She then indicates that uh, Mr. McStay, Joseph McStay, had indicated to her that it was his intent or desire to phase actually both Mr. Merritt and Mr. Kavanaugh out of business. And other evidence indicated that uh, indeed there was already a plan in place to buy out Mr. Kavanaugh that was almost complete. But that he also intended to phase Mr. Merritt out of the business and get a warehouse where he could have more welders uh, to fabricate more waterfalls. And she indicated, Ms. Blake indicated, that Mr. McSay indicated to her the reasons why Joseph McSay wanted to face Mr. Merritt out of the business. Uh, they were that Mr. Merritt had money problems, that Mr. McSay had loaned money to Mr. Merritt but had not been paid back, that part of Mr. Merritt's money problems were uh, as a result of gambling. And we saw from the uh, accountant's examination of Mr. Merritt's bank records uh, that that depiction that Joseph McStay gave to Susan Blake, his mother, appears to be accurate. Uh, Mr. Merritt did have money problems. His bank account was often overdrawn or down to a zero balance. Indeed, the accounts ultimately were closed uh, because they were so far overdrawn. Uh, analysis of the accounts also indicates a significant portion of Mr. Merritt's uh, income or money in his accounts was utilized uh, for gambling or playing poker, depending on whether or not you consider poker a game of chance or a game of skill. Uh, but at any rate, at uh, casinos. Um, so that's substantiating the information uh, that Ms. Blake related. The pattern of Mr. Merritt uh, having money problems and needing additional money and not paying back what he said he would pay back continued after the disappearance of the McStay family. 
uh, beginning only days after the family disappeared, Mr. Merritt told Susan Blake that he needed additional money to complete existing projects. Uh, and Kavanaugh said, no, he didn't need that money. He had already gotten enough money to uh, complete the projects. There actually was an argument between Mr. Kavanaugh and Mr. Merritt regarding that. Uh, Susan Blake ultimately did advance uh, Mr. Merritt over $5,000 of her own funds. Uh, ostensibly to complete existing projects uh, with the understanding she would be paid back when those projects were completed. Mr. Merritt subsequently reported to Ms. Blake that indeed the Saudi Arabia project had been completed, and he had received $17,000 for that project. So Ms. Blake asked him to repay the $5,000 that he had advanced, that she had advanced him. He did not do so, and basically there was little, if any, contact, further contact between Ms. Blake and Mr. Merritt after that point. Also learned uh, additional financial issues, not only of Mr. Merritt, but between Mr. Merritt and Mr. McStay that were reported to Joseph McStay. We learned from Elva Fonseca, who was a bookkeeper for Mr. Merritt's company, I Design or I designed for you, that in 2007, Mr. Merritt was uh, working with Joseph McStay doing fountains uh, for him, and Mr. McStay would pay for water pumps uh, to be used for the fountains, but that Ms. Fonseca indicated Mr. Merritt actually used those funds to purchase pumps for projects of his own rather than on Mr. McStay's projects. And she indicated that she informed Mr. McStay of this. And that Mr. Merritt would report that certain fountains uh, commissioned by McStay were completed and asked for payment when in fact they were not completed. And again, Ms. Fonseca indicated she reported all of this information to Joseph McStay. And that Mr. McStay, either the defendant told Ms. Fonseca or Mr. McStay that he needed the money for rent and to pay expenses of his business to keep his business open, open. And Mr. McStay continued to pay in order to help Mr. Merritt out. Again, substantiating the information provided by Susan Blake. We learn of additional financial issues, again, between Mr. Merritt and Mr. McStay, close to the time of the disappearance of the McStay family through Joe Cicada from Metro Sheet Metal. Uh, at the, that point in time, late 2009, early 2010, Mr. Merritt uh, was still producing or working with Mr. McStay to produce to produce or fabricate fountains. Mr. Merritt was doing that at Metro Sheet Metal. Uh, Metro 
sheet metal was fabricating the fountains. Mr. Merritt did his portion. Metro Sheet Metal did their portion. When the fountains were completed, Mr. McStay would pay uh, Metro Sheet Metal for the uh, project. And there was an issue where Mr. McStay gave a check, and the way Mr. McStay would deliver those checks is he would uh, give Mr. Merritt the check to deliver to Metro Sheet Metal. Uh, in early 2010, uh, Mr. McStay gave Mr. Merritt a check to give to Metro Sheet Metal, but the check was never given to Metro Sheet Metal. And Mr. Cicada, either he or his father, him being present, told Mr. McStay that they did not receive the check and was the discussion that was given to Mr. Merritt. He was supposed to deliver it. And ultimately, Mr. Merritt indicated, yes, he got the check, and he used the check for supplies. There were no receipts for the supplies. There was no verification of any specific supplies. The bottom line was Metro Sheet Metal did not get paid uh, the sums that they should have been paid by the check that was given to uh, Mr. Merrick. So again, the, the, not only does it show financial issues with Mr. Merrick, but more importantly, it shows that again, close in time to the time that uh, the McStay family disappeared, this was actually communicated to Joseph McStay. There were uh, Metro Sheet Metal also advised Joseph McStay uh, that there were increasingly times where Mr. Merritt was not present uh, at Metro Sheet Metal to complete the work that was necessary, and they told Joseph McStay that they could not continue with Mr. Merrick at Metro Sheet Metal because uh, he was unreliable and he was gone a lot. And that it would be up to Mr. McStay to deal with Mr. Merrick. And again, that corroborates and supports the information that uh, Susan Blake provided as to uh, Joseph McStay's uh, feelings and intent with regard to <coughs> Mr. Merrick. Then, additionally, on February the 4th, at approximately 11.50 a.m., uh, we have exhibit number 442. Uh, the testimony regarding that was that it showed a phone call from Joseph McStay to his bank, Union Bank. And there was some testimony about how long of a call that was. So it's against this backdrop of information that then leads to the meeting between Mr. Merritt and Mr. McStay at Chick-fil-A on February the 4th. The cell phone information, uh, the location of the cell phones of both Mr. Merritt and Mr. McStay seem to corroborate and at least consistent with Mr. Merrick's statement that they did in fact meet at uh, Chick-fil-A. Both of their uh, phones uh, indicated they were in that general area. So it's against this general backdrop of all of this information uh, occurring and all of this information being provided to Joseph McStay that Joseph 
Chelsea and Mr. Merrick then meet at Chick-fil-A the afternoon of February the 4th. We also know uh, that a family friend of the McStays, MacGyver McCarter, was assisting the McStays principally summer with uh, painting at the residence. He was there on January the 31st, February 2nd, and February 3rd of 2010. And he was set to return on February the 6th to repaint an area where the wrong color was uh, used by him. Uh, he called Summer on February the 5th to confirm that he was still coming over to finish the painting on February the 6th, but there was no answer. He called again on February the 6th, and again, there was no answer. So that kind of gives us a little bit of a pattern of uh, what was happening with the McStay family during that time period. So, after the February 4th meeting with Mr. Merritt and Mr. McStay at Chick-fil-A, uh, as pointed out, the, uh, there's a phone call, I believe it's between Mr. Merritt and Mr. McStay, around 5.45, 5.48, 5.49, uh, somewhere in that range. Uh, not sure who called who. Uh, the next, uh, or the last phone contact, or last phone activity, is a call placed from Mr. McStay's cell phone to Mr. Merritt's phone, and that was, I think it was 942, something like that, 842, 942? 828. 828, okay. Uh, and the evidence indicates that it shows on Mr. Stay's phone records that that phone call was made to that number, but there was no answer. Phone may not, uh, Mr. Merritt's phone may not have even been on. Uh, at any rate, it was not recorded and did not show up on Mr. Merritt's phone. Uh, so we know that uh, that call was placed from Mr. McStay's phone at that time, 828 or whatever it was. The rest of the evidence strongly indicates that the McStay family was taken from the residence either the evening of February 4th or early morning hours of February the 5th. Um, the fact that there's no cell phone activity for either Joseph or Summer uh, that could really be attributed to either one of them after the 5.30ish call, uh, along with all of the other circumstances, uh, strongly indicates that they were ta at least taken from the residence, uh, as I say, the evening, uh, sometime during the evening into the early morning hours, evening hours of February 4th into the early morning hours of February the 5th. And we certainly know from the rest of the evidence that they were killed and that they were buried uh, up in the desert. We also know that uh, Joseph McStay's Susan Trooper 
was left at a shopping mall in San Ysidro by the border on February the 8th. And we know that the drive from Fallbrook to that location is about a one and a half hour drive from uh, the Fallbrook residence. And as pointed out, uh, once that vehicle was recovered, uh, it was uh, processed, including for DNA. Subsequently, there was an analysis to compare uh, the DNA profiles that were recovered from the vehicle to uh, potential individuals. Uh, particularly Mr. Merrick. With regard to the DNA on the steering wheel, uh, the evidence was that there was a trace amount of DNA that was consistent with Mr. Merrick's DNA profile. And the chances of an individual having that particular DNA profile is one in 850 million, which certainly is one in 850 million Caucasians, which is certainly more than the population of the United States. Um, so it certainly indicates that that trace DNA that was found on the steering wheel was Mr. Merritt's. There was also a trace, a low, very low level trace DNA found on the gear shift. And that profile was also consistent with Mr. Merritt. But because it was such a low level, there were much fewer markers that were identified. And so the statistical probability of the particular profile found on the gear shift is only one in 3,300. So while rare and including Mr. Merritt would certainly leave room for the possibility of others, but when combined with the results on the steering wheel, certainly <coughs> leads to the conclusion that it was Mr. Merritt's DNA on both the steering wheel and the gear shift. Mr. Merritt was, was interviewed and asked about uh, whether or not he ever drove the Isuzu Trooper. He indicated no, he never drove the Isuzu Trooper. He asked uh, if he was ever in the Isuzu Trooper. He said yes. He was asked when was the last time that he was in the Isuzu Trooper. And he said about a month and a half before the family disappeared. So roughly six weeks before the family disappeared. Uh, and he indicated he was a passenger in the vehicle. He and uh, Joseph McStay either wanted to play soccer or paintball, uh, one of the two. Uh, significantly, there is at least at this stage, there is no evidence that there was any direct contact between Mr. Merritt and Mr. McStay to transfer any of Mr. Merritt's DNA to Mr. McStay. Now, certainly there's an argument or an inference that, well, if they're out playing soccer, if they're out playing paintball, they must have come into contact with each other. They could have shook hands at the beginning, shook hands at the end, uh, all kinds of possibilities for contact. But there's no actual evidence that there was any such contact. So even if there was contact, that leaves open the possibility of uh, transferring Mr. Merritt's DNA to Mr. McStay and then depositing it onto the steering wheel or the gear shift 
when Mr. McStay touched those items. Whether or not that would still be <coughs> detectable six and a half weeks later, 42 to some odd days later, uh, with Mr. McStay driving the vehicle on a daily basis during those 42 days, and Mr. Merritt not being in the vehicle those 42 days, is doubtful. Um, particularly, of course, if the vehicle was washed or cleaned or the steering wheel or gear shift was white. Of course, there's no evidence that the vehicle was washed or cleaned or, or white. Uh, but still, uh, the fact that uh, under those, the totality of those circumstances, uh, that with, and Mr. Merritt's DNA is found on the steering wheel and the gear shift is an indication, a strong indication, that Mr. Merritt uh, was in the vehicle uh, much more recently than the six weeks before uh, the family disappeared, which again supports the inference that he's the one who left the vehicle at the uh, San Ysidro uh, shopping area. And obviously, if someone, if any perpetrator, took the family on the fourth, they left the vehicle, San Ysidro on the eighth, it might suggest a different uh, scenario. So there would be a reason for leaving uh, the vehicle there. It's also interesting that the defendant in his statements indicates that he talked to Joseph McStay on a daily basis, usually multiple times a day. And after the disappearance, he indicated that he was continuing to try to reach Joseph McStay. However, the testimony with regard to the cell phones, that there were 25 voicemails on Joseph's cell phone after the disappearance, 31 voicemails on Summer's uh, voicemail after the disappearance of various people trying to contact them and inquire if they were okay, but none of those were from the defendant. So with the backdrop of information about the financial issues of Mr. Merritt, financial issues between Mr. Merritt and Mr. McStay, the problems of Mr. Merritt at Metro Sheet Metal. It's also interesting that when Mr. Merritt is interviewed by the San Diego authorities shortly after the disappearance, he reports that he and Joseph are or were best friends. Uh, they were good business partners, good working relationship. Uh, there's no mention of any conflicts regarding uh, him not paying Joseph back for various sums, conflicts with Metro Sheet Metal, uh, any of that information. We also learned uh, that the financial
factual issues of the defendant uh, continued after the disappearance, I indicated uh, the issues with Susan Blake. We also had evidence from uh, Dice Construction that uh, Mr. McFay was doing a waterfall for them. They had paid for the waterfall. Uh, they were trying to get the waterfall to them uh, after the McFay family disappeared. They were put in touch with Mr. Merritt. Mr. Merritt indicated he needed more money to complete the project, even though the amount of the initial invoice had been paid. Additional funds were sent to complete that. Additional $6,000 to Mr. Merritt. Additional $1,900 to Metro Sheet Metal. Uh, but it was still not completed. Ultimately, someone from Geist Construction had to go to Metro Sheet Metal, pick up the partially constructed fountain, uh, return it to their location, and complete the fountain. Then we learned about uh, activity on Mr. McStay's QuickBook accounts. Uh, after the McStay family disappeared, we learned that there were a number of checks that were written to and cashed by the defendant, but they were then deleted from the QuickBooks registry. as well as some checks to Metro Sheet Metal, and that the, and prior to that, uh, there was evidence that Mr. Merritt and Metro Sheet Metal were added as vendors to the account, even though they were already actually vendors. And when they were added, uh, it was done in all lowercase letters whereas previously it had been done in uh, caps. And the checks that were printed out and cashed to, to Mr. Merritt and to Metro Sheet Metal were in all lowercase as well. We learned from Ryan Baker that on February the 9th, he received a, uh, who is a, works for Intuit and QuickBooks, and that on February the 9th of 2010, he received a support call. The caller ID information on the screen indicated that it was Mr. McStay. Caller had Mr. McStay's business name, email, and phone number and therefore was identified as the master administrator. And the defendant's cell phone records indicate that uh, his phone made a call to QuickBooks during that uh, time frame. And uh, Mr. Baker indicated that the caller wanted uh, both the account and all of the data deleted. And Mr. Baker indicated that that was highly unusual and suspect. He sent a confirmation email to Joseph to confirm uh, the delete and requested a follow-up from Mr. McStay and did not receive any. So as pointed out by the prosecution, it appears that after the McStay family disappeared, that 
close to fifteen thousand dollars in checks were written against or printed against Mr. McStay's account and cashed by Mr. Merrick. And nineteen hundred dollars additional was uh, sent to Metro Sheet Mail. Cell phone, uh, cell phone, cell tower locations, uh, principally relating to February the 6th of 2010.
certainly all of that information that I've just gone over was subject to considerable cross-examination. And I have no doubt that Mr. McGee and Mr. Malin could give their closing argument now uh, on that information, and uh, which would probably take the better part of a day. Uh, and with a different argument, a different analysis, different inferences, and different conclusions to be drawn. Um, but that really is not the standard for the court to look at with regard to an 1118.1 motion to dismiss. The standard on 1118.1 motion is not that all other analysis or conclusions can be uh, eliminated. Uh, but rather, the standard is if the jury were to accept, uh, and of course, I'm not going through every exhibit, I'm not going through every item of evidence and every point that the prosecution may argue that supports a verdict of guilty. I'm only considering what the court considers the primary or major factors. There are a lot of other potential issues that the prosecution may support uh, uh, guilt, but I'm not considering those in the 1118.1 motion. Uh, so, the, as I was saying, the, the standard is not that uh, can the court eliminate all of those other analysis or conclusions, but rather the standard on the 1118.1 motion to dismiss is if the jury were to accept the, pros the prosecution's evidence and arguments and analysis and conclusions and conclude that that is sufficient to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt and therefore uh, return a verdict of guilty and thereby, at least by inference, was rejecting the defense evidence, the defense arguments, and the defense analysis, would that decision by the jury be supported by substantial evidence? The points that I just went through in the court's view do support or would support such a finding by the jury. So the court finds that if the jury accepted the prosecution's evidence, arguments, and conclusions, and returned a verdict of guilty, that there is substantial evidence to support such a finding. For those reasons, the motion to dismiss pursuant to penal code section 1118.1 is denied. So, are we just going to come back on Tuesday? Uh, okay. That would be the defense of this request. There's no further uh, hearing that we see uh, necessary. Okay, very good. So we'll be in recess until uh, Tuesday, March 12th uh, at 9 a.m. for uh, council. We do have OSC schedule, I believe, Friday. Oh, yes, this Friday. Yes, and so can we keep that on calendar? Yes. Do you want to be trying to keep that? Oh, we have something from Google. Oh, we have something from Google. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, in the event we still need the OSC for Microsoft, uh, my client would like to waive his presence. The court must take that waiver on the record so we don't have to transfer. Sure. Uh, Mr. Merritt, you understand that we may be uh, conducting an order to show cause hearing if uh, Google or Microsoft do not provide the information that was uh, subpoenaed. Uh, you obviously do have an absolute right to be present for that. Is it your desire to waive your right to be present and agree we can conduct uh, that hearing uh, with your attorneys being present but without you being present? Yes, sir. And uh, you join in that? Join. All right, we'll show a waiver of 
uh, Mr. Merritt's presence for that. So we do have uh, the subpoena DT to uh, they did not provide the documentation requested that this is just the letter that you previously indicated that you received that they're objecting to uh, the subpoena on the grounds indicated. Correct. So we'll uh, keep the OC on for uh, Friday. Okay? Tuesday, March 12th, 9 a.m.